Welcome back to another exciting episode of Dave's Garage. I'm your host, Dave Plummer, and today we've got an electrifying showdown you won't want to miss. That's right, folks. In this exciting episode, we're going to pit the GPU and the CPU head-to-head -to, -head to see which one reigns supreme when it comes to computing prime numbers. We'll be pushing these powerful processors to their limits as we explore their unique capabilities and see how they're optimized for their intended rules. Which one will emerge victorious? The versatile and mighty CPU or the parallel processing powerhouse, the GPU? Join me as we dive deep into the world of how a prime sieve works, unravel the mysteries of computational efficiency, and witness an epic battle that's sure to leave you on the edge of your seat. We'll also be giving away a 4080 GPU to one lucky subscriber, so buckle up and get ready for a high-octane ride through the fascinating realm of prime number crunching, right here in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Last week, we compared over 90 languages to pick a top 5 leaderboard of the fastest 5. I won't spoil it in case you've not seen it yet. Check it out next if you haven't. But today, we're going to use one of those top 5 languages, C++, to race the CPU versus the GPU in order to determine which one is faster at solving prime numbers. We're going to pit the NVIDIA 4080 against a 32-core Threadripper, testing it for sieves ranging from 1 million to 100 billion. I'll walk you through precisely how a prime sieve works, and we'll take what might just be your first look at how to write CUDA code to run on the GPU. Now, CPUs and GPUs are both essential components of modern computing systems, but they serve different roles and are optimized for distinct tasks. Let's take a quick look at a comparison between the two in terms of their computational styles and optimizations. Computational Style CPUs are designed for sequential, general-purpose computing. They are comprised of a few powerful cores that can handle a wide variety of tasks. This makes them well-suited for tasks requiring complex logic, branching, and decision-making. GPUs, on the other hand, are designed for parallel processing. They consist of thousands of smaller cores that work together simultaneously to process large amounts of data. This design makes GPUs ideal for tasks that can be broken down into smaller, independent calculations, such as rendering graphics, image processing, and mathematical operations in scientific simulations. Architecture CPU architectures focus on high clock speeds, large caches, and complex instruction sets to efficiently execute a wide range of tasks. Modern CPUs also include multiple cores and support multiple threading, which allows them to handle multiple tasks simultaneously. With hyperthreading, many can do almost two tasks at once per physical core. GPU architectures are optimized for high-throughput parallel processing featuring thousands of simple cores with lower clock speeds and smaller caches compared to the CPU. They are specialized for executing simple and repetitive tasks quickly and efficiently. Memory Hierarchy CPUs usually have access to larger amounts of system memory and several layers of cache memory, such as L1, L2, and sometimes L3, to store and quickly retrieve data during computation. This helps CPUs manage complex and diverse workloads. GPUs have their own dedicated high-speed memory called VRAM, which is optimized for fast read and write access during graphics processing. However, the memory hierarchy in GPUs is less complex than that of CPUs as they are focused on raw processing power for specific tasks. Task Suitability CPUs are optimized for general purpose computing, which include tasks like running operating systems, executing complex applications, and handling diverse workloads. They excel at tasks that require low latency and fast decision making. GPUs, on the other hand, are optimized for tasks that can be parallelized, such as rendering graphics, deep learning, and scientific simulations. They excel at tasks that require high throughput and can be broken down into many simple, independent calculations. One important difference between today's showdown and the top five languages is that we're not interested in how many times a multi-core processor can solve primes in parallel. This time, we're looking for how fast it can return the correct results and how many times it can do it in five seconds, one after the other. Both cases, of course, have to use the CPU to an extent to drive the logic, but in the GPU case, we're going to use the GPU for the grunt work of flagging primes within the sieve as non-prime. To do this, we're going to make use of a concept known as a segmented sieve. To better understand this, let's take a quick step back and investigate how a prime sieve works. Let's say we're trying to solve all the prime numbers up to 100. We list those numbers out, which I'll arrange into a grid. The process of running the sieve is very simple. It can be broken down into two basic steps. We know that by definition, one is not prime, but everything else is a candidate. To get started, we find the next number in the sieve that has not been marked as non-prime. When we start out, this will be the number 2. Then all we do is cross off every future multiple of 2, 
so not to itself. This first step then eliminates all of the even numbers that are higher than 2. At this point, we know that 2 is prime. Then we simply repeat. The next number in the list is 3, so we know it's prime as well, and we mark every other multiple of 3 as non-prime. Now, some of these, like 6 and 12, will have already been marked off when we crossed off the multiples of 2, but that's by design. We're interested in what remains unmarked at the end no matter how many times a particular number is crossed off the list due to its multiple factors. Moving up, we see that 4 is already marked, so our next number is 5. We cross off all other multiples of 5. 6 has already been marked, so our next prime is 7, and we cross off other numbers that are multiples of 7. 8, 9, and 10 are already marked. So at this point, we're done, and by now I'm confident that you can see that the numbers that have not been crossed off are prime, meaning they did not collide with any of the prime factors that we walked through the list. We only needed to work our way up to the square root of the total, which is 10 in this case, since no number can have a prime factor greater than its square root. And when we've walked our way up to the square root, our work is done. Those numbers that remain in the list without having been crossed off are our prime numbers. For the numbers under 100 then, the primes are 2, 3, 5, 7, and any other numbers that have not been marked off in the table. Now this is a fine task for the CPU to be performing, but the GPU wouldn't be very good at it. The GPU is intended for simpler operations that it can do many of at once, and that's where the segmented sieve comes into play. To achieve it, we'll use the CPU to again solve just the primes up to the square root, but without doing the work of rolling the multiples through the rest of the sieve. We're going to delegate that work to the GPU, which can do it very quickly and in parallel. And so, our algorithm becomes a hybrid as follows. First, we use the CPU to calculate the primes only up to the square root. Then we take that small list and hand it off to the GPU. The GPU will use that list to roll through memory and mark all of the primes in the sieve memory, which is what really takes time in performing a sieve. When the GPU has done the heavy lifting, what remains in the sieve is the complete set of prime numbers. For example, if we're doing a million numbers, we just have to solve the primes up to 1000. There are 168 prime factors under 1000, so we hand that list of 168 primes to the GPU, and it rolls through all 1 million bits doing all the multiple marking for us. What's important, however, is that the GPU, which has literally thousands of cores, can do them all in parallel in a single step. One GPU core will be busy marking off multiples of two, while another is marking threes, and another is marking fives and sevens, and so on. In fact, with thousands of cores and only 168 primes to work with, the GPU is quite underutilized for smaller sieves like 1 million. Because the GPU has so many cores, it'll barely break a sweat doing 168 things at once, something that would be impossible even on a 64-core Threadripper. But the difference gets even more pronounced when we work on larger sieves. If we're doing a sieve of 1 billion instead of 1,000, there are over 3,400 prime factors to work with. But the NVIDIA 4080 has 9,728 CUDA cores, so it in theory can be marking 9,728 primes in memory at once. Contrast this with the CPU, which can only muster a few dozen at once at best, and the advantage that the GPU holds becomes much more apparent. If our sieve becomes large enough that there are more primes than the 9,728 cores that I have, it won't happen in a single pass for such a large sieve. But as soon as a core becomes free, it picks up the next prime from the list, and the GPU scheduler sends it on its way, marking multiples. As you can imagine, this is much faster when you have thousands of cores, rather than just a few dozen. This all begs the question of how you actually program a GPU, something that feels like a bit of a mystical art. Intellectually, you are likely aware that games use the GPU, but even 3D game programmers work through an API such as OpenGL or DirectX, so they're not actually directly programming the GPU. There's no Direct Primes API, for example, so we need to write the code raw from scratch to run on the GPU. How do we do it? Well, the first thing we need is some kind of programming API that can talk to the GPU, and the one we need is called CUDA. CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's a parallel processing computing platform and API created by NVIDIA for their GPUs. The CUDA platform enables developers to use the massively parallel architecture of GPUs to accelerate compute-intensive applications in a variety of fields. It's produced by NVIDIA to target their GPUs specifically, and it lets you express your code in C++, which is why I've selected C++ as the language that we'll be working in. I'm going to do it in Ubuntu Linux, and I've tested it on a couple of different machines. I had a lot of help from our channel hero named Rutger, as well as a little help from ChatGPT. First, we wrote it on a bare metal Ubuntu installation, but that machine only had a Tesla P4. And here's where I owe a debt of gratitude to the generosity of NVIDIA, who sent me a 4080 GPU to run these tests. 
They also agreed to send me a second unit to be given away during this episode, so stay tuned to find out if you're the lucky subscriber who has won it. Now, naturally, I wanted that 4080 in my main dev machine, which runs Windows 11, but I didn't want to rewrite the code for Windows natively, so I opted to use the WSL2 Linux subsystem, and it worked great. All you have to install is the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit, which will give you a new compiler called NVCC that invokes GCC for the C parts and does the GPU code compilation for you. But what does CUDA code actually look like? Well, fortunately, it looks a lot like C, though it's a tad more limited. You still have access to all of your control logic and most of the standard C runtime, so you can call functions like memset and so on. Telling the compiler that you want the code to run on the GPU rather than the CPU is thankfully simple. You simply preface your code with the global keyword, as we can see in the example, in the function we use to initialize all of our bits in the prime civ to a known value of 1. The initialize buffer function takes a block size and a count of words that it's supposed to initialize, as well as a pointer to the civ memory itself. Otherwise, it's plain old C. It walks from the start index to the end index, setting each word of memory to D word max, which will be all ones. As you can see, we're doing 32 bit words at once, not a single bit or byte at a time. We experimented with 64 bits as well, but it didn't prove any faster, so we stuck with 32. When we call it, we give it a block size and it's divvied up amongst multiple cores to do the work. Let's have a look at how it's called. Here's where it gets a little more obtuse. The caller is written using triple angle brackets following the function name, and the values in those brackets indicate things like how many blocks it should be broken up into and how many threads should run on each. We want them all done at once, so we only pass a single thread, but we've calculated the block size based on the number of cores and the amount of memory we have to set. The GPU will now run off and do its work async with the CPU, meaning it happens in parallel and your CPU code continues running. At some point, we can't continue until we know the GPU has done its work, however, and we accomplish that with a CUDA device synchronized call whose purpose is to have the CPU wait until the GPU is ready. When the synchronized call returns, we know that our GPU has done its work and that the sieve memory contains our results. Here's the real meat of the sieve. The for loop here is its own little prime sieve running entirely on the CPU, but it doesn't calculate all the primes, only those up to the square root of the limit at hand. Each time we find a new prime on the bottom of the sieve, however, we add that prime to a variable called the prime list. When this little piece of code is done then, we have a list of all the primes up to the square root of the limit. The rest of the work, which simply amounts to running those multiples through the big prime sieve array, will be done by the GPU when it is called by the unmark multiples call. It in turn calls unmark multiple threads, which will run on multiple concurrent GPU threads. The work is divided up so that each GPU thread only has to do some of the work, and you can see the actual work of clearing bits in memory being done by the atomic AND call, which makes sure that there's no race conditions where two GPU threads are trying to set the same value in memory at the same location at the same time. The big question, however, is whether all of this added complexity adds up to any performance gains, and for that, we need to actually run the code. Let's set the target at 10 million and run the CPU-only version first. We navigate to that folder that contains the solution and launch it with 10 million as the argument. Next, we move to the CUDA folder, which contains the GPU solution. We now run this solution, again specifying a limit of 10 million and working up. The GPU comes back with 3,673 passes completed in 5 seconds. Already we can see that the GPU solution is more than three times as fast, but we're not really giving it a fair shot. We optimize memory by assuming the fact that every even number shouldn't even be considered, so the prime sieve contains only the bits for the odd numbers. That means that for a prime sieve of 10 million, we need 5 million bits. 5 million bits is 625,000 bytes, but what's 625k when you're talking about a GPU with 20 gigabytes of memory? For the GPU to really shine, we're going to have to dial up the sieve size before we can take advantage of the power that the GPU has. We can step up the sieve size to 100 million bits, and then a billion bits, and 10 billion, and so on. But even at 10 billion bits, it's only 1.25 billion bytes, or just over 1 gigabyte of GPU memory. We can push the sieve size out to 100 billion, which is 12 gigabytes. That should fit nicely within the video card, and sure enough, it does. I wanted to push it out to 1 trillion, since that would make for an awesome thumbnail to solve the primes up to 1 trillion, but neither the GPU nor the CPU has access to about the 125 gigabytes of raw RAM that it would require. We'd be thrashing on virtual memory and measuring disk speed more than processing speed, so I had to cap it at 100 billion. And with that, then how did the GPU and CPU stack up in their head-to-head -head performance showdown? Let's have a look at this dandy bar graph that I made. Representing this on a graph was a bit of a challenge, since the time needed to solve the sieve expands exponentially. That means I had to graph everything logarithmically, which in turn means that it obscures some of the differences between the two. 
So when looking at this graph, keep in mind that a factor of two in the bar graph is actually a factor of 10 in terms of time. And if you look at it that way, it's clear that the GPU trounced the CPU for every sieve size except for a single million. A million bits is only about 120k of memory, which is not really the domain where the GPU can stretch its legs since there were only 168 core primes versus some 9,000 processing cores. Once we get to the larger sieve sizes, however, it's apparent that the GPU holds a large advantage. At a sieve size of 1 billion, the CPU took almost 2 seconds while the GPU was done in a mere 1 tenth of 1 second. Not bad for our first CUDA program, and there's likely lots of room to improve things if this were done by an experienced CUDA developer. Even as it is, though, the difference is striking. By 100 billion, the GPU has left the Threadripper in the dust. As a bit of an odd comparison, back in high school, one of my computer science assignments in the day was to solve the primes up to 1000, and when written in basic on a super pet, it took about 5 seconds. The GPU can solve the primes up to 20 billion in that same amount of time. Even with prime sieves becoming exponentially more complex as the sieve gets larger, the GPU outperforms the Super Pet solution by a factor of 1 million to 1. Super Pets aside for the moment, that makes the GPU the clear winner against the CPU on contemporary hardware. Now, it's not the only winner because today we're giving away a 16 gigabyte NVIDIA 4080 GPU to one lucky viewer. Let's find out who that is. And that viewer has the YouTube username of, wait for it, Eratosthenes. I wrote a Python script to randomly select a winner, and I don't know what the odds are that the winner would have that username when selected in an episode about the sieve of Eratosthenes, but there it is. If it's the same guy, he's really old by now, but I'm glad to hear that such an illustrious gentleman is a fan of the channel. Make sure you like him, you're subscribed. All Eratosthenes has to do is to reach out to me at the email address on the channel about page, and I'll confirm their identity and get the card shipped out promptly. Congratulations. If you haven't already seen the top five languages or the comparison between C, C Sharp, and Python, check out those episodes on the channel. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.